Welcome and a law. I'm Mark Schlav, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea of public opinion to speak with David Strand. Davy, as he prefers to be called, is a lifelong political activist and has a long professional career that spans the United States from being elected to the city council in his birthplace of Cleveland, Ohio, serving as chair of the Marin County Democratic Party and practicing immigration law in San Francisco for 34 years before he and his wife retired in Hawaii eight years ago. Uh, Davey recently wrote an editorial for the Honolulu Star Advertiser about war versus diplomacy. The, the editorial was titled Replace West, Wasteful Wars with Diplomacy and began by discussing the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan. I want to welcome Davey. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, and I want to ask you the, my first question, what motivated you to write that editorial? Well, I'm grateful to be able to uh, discuss uh, this issue, uh, which is close, close to my heart. Um, when I was uh, a teenager, I, I looked forward to uh, serving in the Navy and, and seeing the world. But when I was in college, the Vietnam War uh, was uh, uh, expanding, and, and I felt we were doing absolutely the wrong thing in Vietnam, and I became a kind of an anti-war activist. Uh, and subsequently, over the years, I was involved personally and with various organizations in uh, that sought peace and, and peaceful change in the world. When I moved to Hawaii, well, we came uh, eight years ago. My wife is originally from here. I was just uh, taken aback by the pervasiveness of the military in Hawaii, more than I'd ever seen before. There were planes flying over and military vehicles and, and uh, you know, people in uniform and in uh, restaurants and shopping centers. And that kind of uh, motivated me to really think that we, this is, we shouldn't have all this. Now, and, but specifically regarding the article, uh, when Biden uh, withdrew our forces from from Afghanistan, I thought it was a great thing because, uh, you know, almost virtually everybody thinks that we haven't accomplished much there and it has been a waste of our efforts, but it's been hard to get out. And Barack Obama didn't get us out of there. He wanted to and Trump didn't, but, but Biden did and he did it quickly. But but he got all sorts of criticism for it. He didn't do it right. All the, what I call uh, Monday morning quarterback said, well, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You know, you left a lot of people there. You know, we, we evacuated over 100,000 people from, the, from, uh, from Afghanistan in, in a very short time. Very, very impressive. I think what he did was wonderful, and he deserves lots and lots of credit for doing it. And, and you think that was the right decision to Absolutely. withdraw, but, but why? Why was withdrawing from Afghanistan the right decision? Well, for 20 years, uh, we supported uh, it. The fact that the Taliban took over so quickly as soon as we were gone is evidence of the fact that our 20 years support for a, for a very unpopular and corrupt government just wasn't doing any good. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's wonderful that we got out, you know, and. Okay, and I, I'm going to put up one of the, the quote number one from your uh, editorial. Uh, you talk about the withdrawal, uh, hopefully leading to diminution of our military presence throughout the world and increase in utilizing diplomacy in our foreign affairs. Uh, this is a direct quote from your editorial, and and you talk about re several reasons why war is not in the national interests of the United States and is generally harmful to the world. And that's another quote from your uh, editorial. Tell us what, 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 what's behind, what is, why, is, why do you believe this? What is your reasons what, for these, making these statements? Now, first of all, uh, our military actions have been counterproductive to our national purpose and our foreign policy. Um, you know, uh, I think it is accepted that the time and energy and money and b uh, lives we sacrificed in, in, in Vietnam and in Iraq and in Afghanistan really didn't achieve 
uh, purposes that we hope that they would. In, in fact, they achieve the opposite purposes. You know, the uh, um, for example, in in the Middle East, the uh, uh, even even the even the um, the short supposedly successful first Gulf War, in which we drove Hussein out of Kuwait. As a result of that war, um, we had left troops throughout the Middle East, and those troops built resentment by Islamic fundamentalists that they used to recruit uh, people who became the terrorists that uh, struck uh, throughout the world, including the, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, 9-11. So basically, it's been counterproductive. That's one reason. Another reason is that war always involves lots of killing. That obviously is bad and it's sometimes necessary, but particularly, uh, you know, non-combatants, innocent people are killed. Even a war like World War II, which, you know, it was an important war that we had to, had to be in and had to win, but it wasn't such a good thing for the uh, millions of people that died in, uh, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the fire bombings of uh, Tokyo and many, many, many German cities. So, War, essentially, unless you're really certain it's worthwhile, it's a pure evil for, for those people who are, um, who are innocent victims. Another thing is it destabilizes the world. War usually creates lots and lots of refugees. Uh, the people are, their lives are ripped apart, they're separated from their homes and their families, and they seek refuge elsewhere. And the places that they go, uh, the people there tend to resent them because their own governments are are spending time and energy and money worrying about refugees rather than their own people. So xenophobia ex expands and, and it's just bad for, to, for that to happen. War also is a diversion of our, of our uh, energies and money from, from all kinds of other needs. Um, when I see a, a black helicopter flying across the sky of over IAEA here, uh, military helicopters, which seem to go by all the time, I think, well, couldn't that money be better spent on maybe air conditioning the public schools in, in, in Hawaii? They're just, you know, we have so many needs having to do with poverty and, and health and education and uh, uh, environmental issues. A good example is uh, Red Hill, for example, where all this, we divert our our, en our energies to doing other things in the military uh, away from more essential needs. And that's not good. And another reason is the focus on the military, I believe, um, you know, gives too much credence to the leadership of military people who make uh, their decisions uh, based on military factors. And there's all these side issues that, that are caused by that, such as PTSD and other um, other mental health problems of our wounded warriors, such as uh, sexual harassment in the, uh, in the military because of the concentration of testosterone rich uh, young men, uh, you know, issue, environmental issues uh, that um, the military doesn't really pay enough attention to. Again, I would mention Red Hill. So these are, these are the kinds of reasons that I think that war is a not very effective tool of our foreign policy. Well, and, and you, you also, I mean, in your, your last statements, you, you were also saying that, we'll talk about a little bit about World War II. I mean, uh, is there any possible military action that will do some good? Yeah, I think there is at times. I think that uh, UN uh, uh, peacekeeping forces, for example, are military and they separate uh, the four, you know, people that are otherwise going to fight. I think that perhaps our our bombing in, in Bosnia of the Serbian troops there saved a, a, a lot of lives there. And I think at times um, no fly zones can uh, be effective in, in preventing worse carnage. So yeah, sometimes, sometimes. And one, one of the interesting quotes that you, I'm gonna put up number four uh, is you talk about the United States having a great many military bases around the world and troops stationed more than 100 countries. I mean, what you know, we don't hear too much about that. Yeah, uh, we, and, but what what is that about? Tell, and and all around the world, for example, in Germany, we we still have 56,000 troops, approximately many bases. Now, why do we have troops in Germany? Originally, they went there because 
we defeated Germany, we occupied the country that we beat in World War II. And then we kept them there because we were threatened by the, uh, the Soviet Union the, uh, and its expansion tendencies. But this Germany is now a very rich country, a real ally of ours. The Soviet Union is no longer there. And why do we still have 56,000 troops in Germany? But let's look other places. Look at uh, Saudi Arabia. I think we have five, um, five air force bases, five major air force bases there. And, and, and what have they caused but resentment and, as I said, kind of an incentive to, for the uh, Islamic fundamentalist militants to, to organize their, their opposition to, to uh, America, which they see as kind of a continuation of the, the Crusades. In, uh, in the middle of Africa, Niger, we have three bases where we have drone stationed, uh, we have um, we have a counterinsurgency people there, and we have surveillance in, in Niger. We have these all over the place. We have these, um, and and I don't think they're nest. Those are just examples, but they are in a hundred countries around the world. China, by the way, has, as far as I'm aware, only one actual base in a foreign country, which is in Djibouti, where we also have a base. <laughs> well, and and uh, you know, so what what is the alternative you're proposing here? Uh, you uh, opposing war. Uh, I understand that uh, you, you you say that military action sometimes has a positive result, but then you're pointing to having all these bases. The United States has all these bases and military all over the world. What is your alternative? What are you proposing? The alternative is uh, diploma is non military diplomacy. Uh, that uh, that means. Uh, uh, treaties that we have with other countries. We, that means some involvement in international institutions like the, like the United Nations. It, it means the use of economics, economic incentives, economic investment. It means um, sharing information and, uh, and, and educating people in the world. It means uh, using negotiation kind of uh, tactics uh, to solve disputes. I'd like to I'd like to mention a, a couple of examples that I've been personally involved with. Northern Ireland, for example, um, uh, 300 years ago, uh, uh, William, the Orange, William of Orange and Protestant defeated King James the Catholic. And since that time, there has been tremendous uh, friction and often violence between the two communities in Northern Ireland. And uh, in the 80s, I, I went to Northern Ireland with a group called the uh, Irish Forum, and we wanted to be part of understanding the process there, understanding the troubles, as they call them, and being part of the peace process. And uh, we talked to people. We talked to leaders of both sides and all leaders of different factions. I, in, in fact, spent uh, some time talking to people in prisons. Prisoners at that time, 80% of the prisoners were political prisoners. Many of them were there because of assassinations. So the people I was interviewing had been, you know, were either were either terrorists or freedom fighters, depending on which side you were in, on. Anyway, when Clinton became president, he really focused on this and he brought American diplomacy. He, he appointed Senator Mitchell of Maine as a special envoy and really focused American energy on that. We had uh, lots of, uh, we, we, we had a lot of uh, influence with the British government, with the Irish government. We put in money as incentives. Uh, we did a lot of things and, and it was successful. A peace agreement was signed and it's pretty much held since that time. That's, that's one example. Another uh, example of an organization I was involved with was called the San Francisco International Program, which brought young professional people from around the world uh, for training. We would set up training assignments in American institutions and they would live with American families. And then, and then they would go back to their home countries. And, uh, and you know, I believe that, um, you know, we had special programs for, for people after the fall of communism from the former Soviet bloc. And we had a special program from people from South Africa after the fall of apartheid. Who prior to that, because of their race, could not move ahead in, in industry or government or nonprofit organizations or anything. And those people go back and they become influential and they become friends of the United States because we treated them nicely and taught them something. So for example, I have friends became the deputy police chief of Johannesburg and the head parliamentarian of the South African uh, 
a parliament and a head of the uh, South African equivalent of the Smithsonian Institution. You know, those kinds of programs really make a difference, as does education. American education of foreign students is a great thing. You know, people come to America, they, they are attracted to America, and they like Americans when they're here, and they're not going to want to bomb us and kill us when they go home. Those are examples. And I, what I hear you saying is people should talk to one another. And I get, that's your idea of diplomacy, or that's your concept, is, is that getting people to talk to one another as the governments did with the Irish situation, and as you have brought people to America to study, they get to know each other, and that will make a wall against killing each other or fighting. Well, that's a big part of it, plus negotiations, plus economic incentives, uh, plus the uh, support of international institutions that uh, are treaties uh, and things like the United Nations that, are, that, that help keep the peace. Uh, look at Europe, for example, the uh, European uh, community. Uh, Europe had centuries of wars between all these countries. And, and, and since, the, uh, since there's a united Europe for most of Europe, you know, there has been very little war there. And, and I want to go back a little bit. You, you were talking about the military in Hawaii, and uh, in your article, you also talk about the ongoing military buildup in Hawaii. And uh, your, your opinion is that, well, well, what is your opinion? Let me, let me ask you. I mean, because uh, there are people in Hawaii that say that the military is a great economic boon for Hawaii. It is certainly a great economic boon for Hawaii. Uh, and, uh, and some of it is, is pretty positive. For example, the Pearl Harbor shipyard, which repairs the ships and so forth for the Navy, uh, uh, employs about 5,000 people, of which only 10% are, are actually in the military. But a lot of the other things are really unnecessary. You know, we're bringing in more Marines to do training and, and artillery training in EVA. We're bringing in these huge drones to station them here. And I think that it, while that is uh, helpful, of course, to the economy, if we could retool our thinking so that uh, other things, other governmental programs that had diplomatic positive aspects would be here. For example, many, not many, a few friends of mine who were in the Peace Corps did their training in Hawaii. For example, the East West Center has uh, programs that bring uh, people to study and people to have conferences and people to have negotiations about issues of nations throughout the Pacific. Um, and, and even the, the military itself, I think, could refocus from purely uh, destructive kinds of things to doing positive things. The military does do you know, humanitarian things. We have ships that go and when there are disasters around the world that, uh, that can help and so forth. And I think uh, retooling within the focus of the military itself, as well as uh, more uh, expenditure on, on Peace Corps type activities. And you, you know, you also mentioned uh, when we were talking China and in your article, uh, the next quote, the fifth quote, you mentioned that we don't understand China's Belt and Road Initiative and other non-military international development efforts where the Chinese are outpacing us. What, what are you talking about? What don't we understand? What, what, how are they outpacing us? They're outpacing us because I believe we are still the wealthiest nation in the world and we still have the know-how to help countries. The, the Chinese are building roads and bridges and ports, but they're all linked to the Chinese economy, kind of pulling everybody into dealing with China. I think we could do uh, a better job. Uh, we have, uh, if we were out there, um, instead of having three bases in Niger, a pretty poor country, if we were focusing on in uh, countries around the world helping building harbors and controlling flooding and helping their education system in, in educate more people who could be useful uh, to the world and, and, and dealing with their health problems. If we did all that kind of thing rather than the military basis, we would be much better off, I think. And China is actually, you know, kind of doing that. Or I don't think we, I think we could do it a lot better. 
so they're kind of ahead of the game is what is what you're saying and, and they're using a strategy that brings people together is, is what i hear you saying is that right yeah it's non-military they're putting an awful lot of money and energy into non-military uh, uh efforts to bring to increase their influence in the world okay now you, you talk about uh doing these uh di diplomatic or pursuing peace but how did we pursue peace with countries like North Korea? Ah, a good example. I, I, I was also involved with a, 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 a organization, a nonprofit organization, an, an NGO, a Korean base called Good Neighbors, which actually uh, was involved in sending people and aid to North Korea in, the, in terms of agricultural aid and food aid in, in areas of, of need in, in North Korea, which there are many. The, the, it's a very, very, very poor country. And, and, and there are, there's an organization that I know of uh, in uh, Washington that uh, has a, a, a committee of about 100 people of key academicians and people from faith groups and people from, from uh, nonprofit groups and, and, and business uh, that, that is all focused on peaceful change in, in, in North Korea. I, I think that uh, with the focus of groups like that, with the fact that we can, uh, we have common cause with China in uh, preventing uh, some kind of nuclear catastrophe, catastrophe coming out of, uh, of, of North Korea. We have a, a lot of very energetic South Koreans who are very, very eager to, to uh, do something to, to bring peace to North Korea. So I think that we have lots of avenues, and if we put the kind of energy into those, we could make a difference in, in North Korea and, and other places. Now, and you've talked a lot about your background in various organizations, and, and I can see that you have been an activist uh, for a long time. Uh, what else? I mean, what else has developed, helped to develop your philosophy about war and the pursuit of peace in the world? And about your, your immigration law background, is that? Been involved with what your thoughts are? Yeah, the immigration background uh, helped. As an immigration lawyer, I fully recognize that um, our country is by far the most desirable place for most people in the world to immigrate to. No other country brings as many immigrants. People want to come here because of economic opportunity, political freedom, religious freedom, etc. And, uh, you know, people are not flocking to China or, or, or Russia or, or India or Pakistan or, or, you know, we have a great culture and people are attracted to it. So that makes me feel uh, proud and that we have something to, worth uh, supporting. Another aspect of my immigration practice that, uh, that made me think a lot about this, I, my favorite cases were political asylum cases. These are people who are in the United States who do not want to return to their home country because of fear of persecution uh, on the basis of political opinion or, or race or, or national origin or, or, or uh, other religion. And I've represented uh, people seeking political asylum from, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from the Americas and from Pacific Islands. And so I know that there's a lot of bad guys out there in the world that are treating their own people very, very harshly. There's a lot of persecution in the world. And, that's a, and I, uh, I believe that um, we can help change that and it will benefit America. You know, um, you, your editorial uh, really advocated pursuing diplomacy and the peace uh, and not military action, not war, but you received a lot of um, pushback from several people. One person wrote that you were not living in the real world, and you, that the re, that that you know the real world requires peace through strength. Another wrote that you might enjoy compromising to the brutality of the Taliban. And another wrote that you were advocating surrender to our enemies who would ultimately slit our throats. Uh, these are what people actually wrote after you did your editorial. Now, how do you respond to these comments? And I mean, are, are you saying that we should surrender? I mean, that's what the, these responses said. 
Well, absolutely not. I believe in in a active and aggressive foreign policy, and I think we should uh, pursue American ideals and American interests through our foreign policy. I think that uh, you know, but we can't. We didn't succeed in defeating the Taliban, and uh, there are a lot of other places in the world where there are similar problems uh, or worse problems uh, than the Taliban. We can't fight them all. But we can have some impact on them through diplomacy. For example, Boko Haram in Africa controls uh, parts of northern Nigeria and uh, adjacent uh, African countries. And their treatment of women is much worse than the Taliban. You know, they have actual, actual uh, sex slavery, not just prostitution, but real slaves. And they use uh, women as suicide bombers. And I mean, it's really bad. We can't solve that militarily. But there are other problems. You know, right in our own hemisphere, uh, in a country like Guatemala for, for, for decades, for hundreds of years, really, the 40% uh, of the people who are indigenous have been pretty much repressed and brutalized by the government there. Uh, I don't think we can solve that uh, uh, militarily. In China, in China, Lots of the goods that we get that say made in China that we buy because they're cheap were made in in uh, re-education centers that are really prisons where they send political dissidents and, and uh, ethnic minorities and they are brutally treated and subjected to torture. And that's in China. We certainly can't solve any problems in China militarily, right? But we are very economically interconnected with China. And we are their major customer for these, all this stuff that they make. And uh, the economic ties that we have could lead to, I think, alleviation of some of those problems. And those are, I, I believe in an, uh, in an aggressive uh, pro-American, uh, I believe in our ideals of our country and our democracy. And, 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 and it, so no, I'm not about to sit back. I'm not, I'm not a defeatist. And, and you're not saying abolish the military. No, uh, I'm not saying abolish the military. I say cut back on a lot of their unnecessary programs. We are, we're always developing new, new weapon systems, but we already have, you know, the world is covered with, the, with nuclear submarines carrying nuclear weaponry. I mean, how much more do we need? And uh, so, yeah, I say, but we do need a military. I, I believe in a strong Navy, open freedom of, commerce on the seas and so forth, but I don't believe we should be attacking countries and we don't need all the military equipment that we have. I think one of the reasons we, we have it is because of the uh, arms industry, uh, because they make a lot of money out of selling new and more sophisticated military equipment. I think it's their influence uh, uh, through, through their, their propaganda, shall we say, also their influence through uh, uh, political contributions to members of Congress. And I'm not saying that they're doing this out of any evil. They probably think they're doing the, the right thing and what's best for the country. But but I, I would disagree strongly. And uh, so. okay, let, let me, we, we have a, a, a couple minutes. I want to, I want to uh, close, but I want to ask you the last quote I want to put up is how basically you closed your editorial. You say, I wish I knew an effective strategy to influence our government to pursue peace with the energy with which we prepare for war. Now, my question, I mean, have you given up hope? Now, I mean, I hear you advocating. I hear that you are a uh, person that uh, wants peace over war, but how do we get there? Is that gonna happen? I mean, what what is, you know, what hope do you have? Well, it's an ongoing struggle, but I think the Biden presidency and the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a very, very, very positive sign. Um, I'm One of the people that most impresses me that's been involved in public life is uh, Samantha Power, who was the UN ambassador under Barack Obama. She's a former uh, uh, human rights activist who is now the head of USAID, the US Agency for International Development. And just before I got on this program now, I, I was reading the mission statement of the US Agency for Inter International Development, USAID, and their mission statement is exactly what I feel we should be doing. 
She, and I think the fact that we have people like that uh, in significant positions in the Biden administration give us a lot of hope that, that things can change and we can come up with a foreign policy that is beneficial to us and helpful to the world and in and, 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 and confronting some of the evil in the world through non-military means. And the military means, I can only say, have just failed again and again. Well, Davey, I want to thank you for sharing your opinion and adding more to what you wrote in your editorial for the Star Advertiser. And uh, we'll see where we go from here. Uh, you know, this is an ongoing matter. Uh, there is a war versus diplomacy. And the question will be who wins uh, and hopefully will come to the right decision. Aloha, Davey. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.